Hey everybody, welcome to podcast number two on the Flying with Burger and podcast. Happy to have you guys here. I have a great guest on. His name is Mike Trost. He is a University of North Dakota alumni in his early 20s and a very successful aircraft salesperson. So something happened to him at UND that caused his career to change from becoming an airline pilot now into aircraft sales. And I think it's got a lot of value that you guys can take and implement in your own journey. So without further ado, let's talk to Mike. Going up, going up, going up, going up, going up, going up, get it that I'm never going up, going up, going up, going up, going up, going up. All right, everybody, welcome to another podcast. Today, I have Michael Troust, former UND, actually UND alum, now selling airplanes at the ripe old age of 18. Uh, 21. That's what I said, 21. (laughs) Yep, 21. So, uh, man, just kind of like going through UND is an aviation school, obviously. Right. Um training the next the next batch of aviators to go off and become airline pilots and you kind of take this uh this little right turn and, and start in uh start in on aircraft sales but before we get into that just tell me about a little bit about your journey and like why you even chose aviation of course um first off thank you very much for having me ernie i yeah. really appreciate uh being on the podcast um to kind of start on that journey um in high school i you know was a pretty pretty good student in the classroom. Um, just kind of realized that he wanted to do something outside and you know kind of be on the move all the time. I, it was yeah. it was tough for me to sit still at the desk. Um, kind of explored my options in that regard. My dad was in the Air Force. Um, he never flew really. He was in the back of an F one eleven a couple of times, and he always oh, wow. told me about that experience. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, that's something I really want to try and pursue. So I sat down with a recruiter uh, for the Air Force, kind of realized that that probably wasn't the, the route I wanted to go. Mm-hmm. So started exploring my past from there a little bit more. Now, why wasn't, uh, why wasn't that the I route? think it was uh, more so the binding time in the contract. Mm-hmm. Um, I, was, I was told it would probably be about a 10-year uh, time frame, mm-hmm. um, you know, being based on all over the country or even overseas, wherever, right. wherever that might be. Um, I think it was more just so the unknown, mm-hmm. you know, going that, airline route or general aviation route at a university was what I wanted to pursue. So started doing my research, uh, first generation pilot in my family. So that was really tough trying to figure out online, you know, who to ask, who to talk to. I didn't have any connections at all. Yeah. Had nobody. Uh, thankfully, um, my sister went to Purdue university and, you know, Purdue oh, wow. university's got a tremendous aviation right. program. Yeah. One of her, um, Guy, guy, best friends at the university got in touch with me and started talking to me about it. I took uh, a weekend, went down to Purdue, explored the university. He showed me around, kind of, you know, told me what it was like to fly mm-hmm. as a student there, and um, told me, you know, he highly encouraged me to go get a Discovery flight. Yeah. So started researching my there home. There it is, Discovery <laughs> flight, <man>. huh? <laughs> I started discovering. In a, you know, a discovery flight in right. my area. So went up for a quick flight, uh, Lansing, Illinois, decided I was going to get my private pilot's license in high school. So that kind of... Uh, now, how old were you so when you I, were started? I was 17 when I started. Um, it was very, very tough. I went into the flight school my, my senior year in high school. Mm-hmm. And I told them I want to get my private pilot's license before I want, wanted to go to the university. And they said, you have three months it's Ooh. it's impossible. Yeah. And I was the first student to go through their flight school. They were a brand new startup flight school. Mm-hmm. Uh long story short of it, I got it done in 3 months. Nice. So, nice. uh believe it or not, I got that certificate the day I left for UND my freshman <laughs> year. It was nice. a, it was a it was a very uh tight uh stressful time crunch. Um well, I was going to say you're carrying a full load, you know, making sure you graduate. Right. And taking a flying course getting your private pilot license, t- something totally new, right. learning everything, new concepts and all that stuff in order to get to UND. Now, when you got to UND, did you fly right away? I did. Uh, I was very, very thankful. Uh, things are a little bit different there now with mm-hmm. their their TCO, as they call it, um, their, their training course syllabus. Um, but the reason why I was able to fly right away was 
what what you did at the time, and this is uh, 2018, is they said if you came in with your private pilot's license, depending on your your GPA or your ACT score from high school, they would allow you to be enrolled in that fall semester of 112. And 112 oh. consisted of just seven flights. I know it sounds really really small, but those you know it could have been seven or or 12 or 14 or 15 flights. And what it was a minimum of seven flights. And what that entailed was you just getting familiar with UND and Grand Forks operations, right. their practice areas, just getting used to, you know, their their different routines and, and work on the ramp is really because what you that guys, was. You guys had SOPs, standard operating procedures that you had to go through. And so that's part of that learning that process. Right, right. And um, the, 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 the biggest uh, advantage of, of obviously going into the university or any any collegiate university for aviation, in my opinion, is to come in with your private pilot's license. It saves you a ton of money and it saves you a ton of time. That's what, that was going to be my next question. Do you feel it was worth it? Hundred um, percent. We did that with my daughter, obviously, and I think before you invest all that money into a aviation university, which is substantial, right. you should probably figure out if this is truly what you want to do. Of course. And if you have the aptitude for it, right? Right, right. And you gotta you gotta see if you know if you're not able to get it done in you know three or three months or even a year in, in, in your high school times, maybe it might not be the best fit for you. I understand, you know, it might take him somebody, you know, two years, but mm-hmm. once you're in that university bubble, you know, it's a very, very pa- fast paced course. Mm-hmm. So um, that's where you'll see, you know, people that you'll start off with at the university, you know, be on track with you. And then you'll start seeing a lot of people taper off or whatnot. But that's the biggest thing is to try not to compare yourself to others. Right. You know, keep your head down and be driven and, and be focused is is really the biggest thing. So your freshman class, how many that started your freshman year? Because my daughter was telling me about this. Mm-hmm. You will start with uh, a large group. Right. Your freshman year going through 112 or even the private course. And you'll have some attrition going through there. How many? How of many? course. You know, it's it's tough to say an exact number. Um, I would say from when I started at UND that freshman fall semester, I would say probably about 50 to 60 percent were, really? able, were able to graduate uh, at the time I did. I was able to graduate a semester early oh, I um, by, by sticking out, you know, a, a summer there. And, and Which is the only time you could fly right. in the UND. I, I <laughs> kid, but, you know, that yeah. is the prime flying right. season at UND. Of course. Right. Um in terms of that four-year uh, path, I would say 80%, and then yeah. I, I would say that last 20% takes another semester or maybe just a little bit more. Yeah. Not not a big deal, though. But not a big deal. No, right? not like, at all. You know, your goal is to graduate, so you don't get extra credit for graduating early. Just graduate, right? Right. Um, and, you know, there's there's no ru- real rush at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. There's there's no point unless, unless your number one goal is, hey, I want to get to the airlines. I need to get a seniority number as quick as possible. Mm-hmm. I could see that. But... What uh, what advice would you give somebody considering? Um, maybe it's an aviation college. Maybe it's something like Sierra Charlie. Mm-hmm. What what advice would you give them for looking for a school? I would say really just. I know it sounds real generic. Just do your homework. Mm-hmm. Ask around. Um, my biggest thing was, I was very very thankful for my parents, um, especially my dad, on taking me to tour a bunch of the different universities across the United States. Mm-hmm. I toured uh, 14 universities at the collegiate level. Wow, 14? Uh, 14. 14, yeah. Wow. If Like physically went out there? Phys- and- physically went out okay. there and okay. uh, walked on the campus. Wow. So that was uh, the, the, the biggest uh, eye-opener. You know, it's, it's different to look up, you know, on a web browser right. what the university looks like, right? They're going to put beautiful pictures and <laughs> smiley, <laughs> smiley right. students on the campus, but it's right. a really big difference in actually walking the campus. So was able to, you know, see those different universities over that course of a summer. It was it was tough. Um, but, you know, like I said, very, very thankful for my dad for allowing me to do that. And, you know, it's very costly and very time uh, time costly. But another... So how did you, how did you decide on UND? Like, what was yeah. that, that factor? That yeah, so there? I uh, looked online. I saw the University of North Dakota. I said, how could University of North Dakota <laughs> be one of the best aviation schools in the yeah. country? Uh, for how big it is, you know, their reputation, John D. Odegaard started that uh, flight school, you know, in the late 50s and really made a powerhouse out of the students that are up there. And as you know, you flying in the airlines, I'm sure you're meeting FOs all the time or other captains that are UND alums. Uh, so that was the biggest thing is online. I saw the reputation. Number two, my dad, one day I came home from from uh, class and, and track practice and he 
I remember this vividly. I was sitting at the family room, a dining table. He showed me his laptop, and it was the University of North Dakota summer aviation camp. So before I went, obviously that fall semester, this was, you know, my senior year uh, high school uh, week, my dad um, signed me up for that. I was very thankful. Went up to UND in Grand Forks for a week, was able to experience what it was like for the day in the life of a college student at the university in that summer, and was able to go up on even more discovery flights, experience what it was like at a UND operation. Wow. And uh, that was very valuable. I walked out of there, called my dad up. I, I didn't even t- see my dad in person yet. I, t- yeah. I called him up. I said, University of North Dakota is where I'm going. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was that uh, serious. You know, yeah. their, their operations, their professional manner, right. and their uh, classrooms in terms of what they had uh, accessible to the students in terms of the high altitude chamber. At, at the That's t- true. At yeah. the time, the University of North Dakota was the only collegiate aviation program in the country that had that. I believe two more uh, do have something similar to that now. Yeah, I think uh, when my daughter went there, I think there was only two in the okay. nation that were collegiate. Right. They might have add, added another one. But, um, yeah, that's interesting. So they had, as part of that uh, summer camp, they had discovery flights as well. Right, they did. So what that entailed was for that seven-day period, I, you know, I don't I don't know exactly or remember exactly what it was, but that first day was kind of an intro then those next five days where we would go up on at least two flights in that day wow. with a, you know, obviously a CFI or a CFII. Uh-huh. And, uh, it was so, it was so cool to me. Um, my first flight was actually IMC really? uh, up there. Yeah. I had no idea what that even entailed. I didn't know what an instrument rating was. I was so clueless. I didn't know anything. Right. We take off and all of a sudden we're in a ping pong ball. <laughs> I'm looking around, you know, yeah. asking the instructor what's going on. And it was really cool because we were partnered up with somebody else from the camp. Mm-hmm. So it was myself and uh, a friend of mine now to this day, Jessica, uh, from San Diego. And uh, we were both, what we would do is flip-flop. So I was in the back seat while she was flying first. We would go fly for an hour, land somewhere, and then we both flip oh, no and kidding. then head back. So wow. we did two flights like that uh, each day was able to see, you know, the difference in commercial maneuvers, instrument, obviously, you know, being in IMC conditions all the way to, you know, even the private pilot ground reference maneuvers. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool. Uh, How did you find out about this? You said your father looked it up and found found that? Yeah, they still offer that to this day, too, at the University of North Dakota. I'm sure there's a bunch of other aviation uh, colleges across the country that do offer offer something similar to this. It was very... You know, I, I, I did get lucky on it. So what, what they did was they only took 26 students. I was going to say, what is the selection process for something so like that? T- and does it cost? Yeah, I, I don't re- you know exactly what it costed, um, but, it, but it was 26 students at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, my, my plan that summer was to – I was cutting grass, just cut, <laughs> cut as many lawns as Yo, I could. hustling, man. <laughs> to help pay for that. Uh, so I, I was able to split it with my dad and um, very, very just very thankful for my yeah. parents for, for – uh, allowing me to have that opportunity because I would I probably wouldn't have gone to North Dakota if I wasn't on their campus like that. On their campus, yeah. Um, but after making that decision on going to North Dakota, obviously that bridge program I was kind of telling you about the 112 is what they called it. Mm-hmm. That was just kind of an accelerated private pilot course if you came in with it. Yeah. And the next step was that spring semester starting up your instrument, right? So. Okay. It's a lot different now. Uh, I don't want to get anybody confused with the the TCO that they have now. But at the time that I was there and enrolled, you would go through, like your daughter, you would go through your instrument, your commercial, and your multi. You wouldn't get your instrument or your commercial certificate right. until you got done with your multi-engine uh, course is what they called it. Yeah, <laughs> which was a little bit confusing, you know, putting my interviewing hat on for the airline. You know, you would you would go through and it would be, well, wait a minute. When did you get your all your ratings? Well, yeah, the university does it a little bit. Different. Right. So it was a little bit of an edu- education for me. Uh-huh. And then when my daughter went through, I could kind of see how they were how they were. We're, doing we're it. working it. Yep. And I think it's correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe a year, a year and a half ago is when they changed changed that philosophy of of instructing over there. Right. In terms of hey, once you get done with your instrument, you're getting your instrument rating. Your, your once you're done with your commercial, you're getting your certificate. Mm-hmm. Once you're done with your multi, you're getting your certificate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, at that time, you know, it was a little bit different. Like I said, after your multi-engine was when you got your instrument commercial and multi all in one. It was all in one check, right? It was yeah. a beast. <laughs> but it saved. It did save money doing that as well. Yeah. 
I could see from an airline standpoint, even for hiring, I could see where it would be super, super confusing, especially right. uh, just because a lot of the universities didn't do that uh, right. s- sort of training. Well, it was confusing in the in the uh, in the aspect that you know, hey, have you ever failed a check ride? Right. You know, and if you're getting your your big check ride down the road, but you finished, you know, the the courses for your instrument or you know, your multi-engine, and then you're waiting on this big check ride, which is the check, check ride. ride, right? So that's where the confusion kind of came from. I mean, we eventually adapted to that, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, it was confusing in the initially. Of course, and I think that that too, as a student standpoint, you know, when you're going through that instrument commercial phase, you're not really as stressed out as you. Sh- I wouldn't say you should be stressed out for a check ride, but you should be a little nervous, right? It's a yeah. it's a very big deal, but. Once that multi-engine check ride comes and you know you're getting your instrument commercial multi, it is a lot of stress on you because <laughs> it's like, wow, this yeah, is all this one. is you know a three banger in one. Right. So uh, that's where you know you saw a lot of kids really focus and knuckle down was the during that that during that phase. Yeah. Um, but okay. Yeah. So you go through, you get through. Uh, what was the the I guess what was your fondest memory of going through UND? I think really it was just interacting with different students all across the country in terms of aviation and hearing their stories. Yeah. Uh, to reflect back on that aviation camp, like I told you, I I didn't know what IMC was. I didn't know what an instrument rating was. I didn't know hardly any aviation terms at all mm-hmm. when I was up there. I was in a classroom of 26 students where I would say 80 to 90% of those other students were not first-gen pilots in their family mm-hmm. or had had some kind of very high level of aviation knowledge in their family history. Really? So I was sitting in the classroom and I was looking around like, you know, why am I here? What am I doing? I was freaking, (laughs) I I was honestly freaking out in in terms of everybody there's parents were airline pilots. They were uh, fighter jet pilots. They, this is a, this is a memory I will remember the rest of my life. We, uh, his name is Ken Polovitz, Professor Ken Polovitz. He went around and he started pointing at every student and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? We were 17 years old sitting there. <laughs> I would say 90% of everybody rose their hand and said, I want to fly a 777. I want to be a captain on a 777. I didn't know the difference between a 777 or a 737. <laughs> when you, when you when first I, got when there? When I no first kidding. got there. Wow. Okay. So I was like, I mean, I've heard of it, right? Yeah. But I, everybody knew the differences. They knew they were international airplanes or even, you know, long you know, super, super long flights. I didn't know that. Wow. So that was really eye-opening for me. I remember on that lunch break, I called my dad and I was like, dad, I, I don't know anything yeah. compared to these kids. I feel like I'm so far behind the curve. And, you know, I felt so behind in that regard. Right. Uh, but I didn't let that discourage me at all. I, I After that camp, I really knuckled down, did my homework and figured out what's out there, what what opportunities are there, what general aviation is, what's the difference between that and airlines, you know, charters, uh, brokerage firms. There's so much aviation that people don't know about, especially at the university level, because they only really talk about the airlines. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's always highlighted. And um, we talked about it in the last podcast where we don't do a really good job of highlighting like all the the opportunities in aviation. Right. Um, But University of North Dakota, I mean, through your process of going through school, you tend to learn about all the different facets. Oh, yeah. And and what's very unique in that situation, too, is you have some some students even go up there to be full-time crop duster pilots. They're, yeah. they're from Western North Dakota. They go to the university and are going to be a full-time crop duster pilot. That's cool. And that's, that's yeah, that's something super unique. Yeah. You, don't, you don't see here in Arizona or in Chicago mm-hmm. or down in Florida. You don't see that. So that was cool. Uh, in terms of, you know, weather mod, you know, seating, that's something else that's super unique. They have a ton of internships up there for those students. Yep. I got a buddy of mine right now. His name's Ryan. He's actually in Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, flying a King Air and doing weather mod for the, for the summer. Oh, wow. He's loving it. Uh, Wow. In, in that regard too, after getting through that first, first year, uh, I had a lot on my plate. I was running track and cross country that first year. Mm -hmm. So it was you know, figuring out the course load, you know, taking 15 or 17 credit hours, whatever it was that first, first uh, semester into that next semester, spring semester. And then, you know, staying up there. Well, I was, my plan was to stay up there for that summer because all the, you know, track athletes were supposed to stay up there with the team and, and and condition. 
So to kind of switch gears a little bit, I was in class one day shuffling through my email on a, on a break and I saw, an, I saw an internship opportunity and that was K2 Aviation in Talkie, you know, Alaska. Wow. In Alaska. So, okay. In Alaska. Yeah. And me being a Midwest, uh, Midwest kid uh, with my family having siblings all, you know, we're all a year apart. We didn't go on a lot of vacations, especially if we did, they were, you know, within driving distance. Right. So I've never seen a mountain when I was 17. Oh, no kidding. I've never seen a mountain. <laughs> And I see this uh, ad to be a intern in Alaska. So I started doing a little bit of research on it. I met with my uh, uh, advisor, and I actually had to meet with my advisor since I was in this I was in this uh, class for uh, intro to athletes at the University of North Dakota is really what the the general term of it was. And I had to sit down with my advisor and kind of just talk about how I'm balancing class and um, you know training for travel uh, for track or whatever and I said you know I love running but I love aviation 10 times more after these you know 10 months that I've been here so I said I saw this amazing opportunity as an intern to be an intern in Alaska I said do you know anything about it I said is this is this phony at all is this a spam or is this legit and he said I've heard of them he goes you have nothing to lose he goes go to Alaska. Yeah. So that day I applied that exact day. I just remember this, like it was yesterday. I, I applied to the internship and it was like, it was a very uh, cool application process. This was my first time applying for something, obviously aviation related for anything under my, you know, to put on my resume or on my, on my belt. And now, there, was that the only one that you applied to, or did you apply to several? That summer was the only one I applied to. The only to. one. You, okay. And, they, uh, you know, asked for like four or five different references. They actually, they actually were very serious about it, and it was great. They were, they were doing this. They were calling each of those references to ask my f- old bosses from my high school jobs. Ooh, you know, kind of like a reference check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was really cool to see that. I got a call um, after doing a, a Zoom interview with somebody uh, named Stephanie up in in Talkeetna. And it offered me to, uh, an internship position. And what that entailed, it was a paid internship uh, position. Cool. After leaving your spring semester, you would be up there May, June, July, and then a little bit into August. Mm-hmm. And uh, what my duties and responsibilities were was to fuel the airplanes, mm-hmm. uh, load uh, climbers' gear, mm-hmm. and uh, obviously you know, make sure the airplanes are ready for flight in terms of oxygen, uh, wipe down the seats, uh, you know, kind of be a dispatch in a way as well. Yeah. So uh, that was really, really cool because that was my that was my introduction into general aviation in a, in a certain aspect. And this was after your freshman year. After my freshman year. Wow. So, so this is typically internships are usually after your junior year. Right. Okay. So uh, this was you know right after freshman year, getting ready to go into sophomore year. Sophomore. That was that summer. Mm-hmm. Now, I felt like I was making a little bit of a mistake doing this in the at the time. Because a lot of my friends were staying the summer to get on the next flight course. You go fly. Yep. And I was like, am I going, you know, this is going to be an awesome opportunity going to Alaska, but am I cutting myself short? Yeah. Didn't do that at all. I was still able to graduate a semester early. So yeah. looking back at it, don't regret it at all. But that summer was the coolest experience of my life. Talking is a town of 740 40 people. Wow. Uh, nearest grocery store is an hour and a half away. Oh, wow. Um, but just seeing, you know, a de Havilland Otter, a de Havilland Beaver, what a Cherokee Six was at the time, or uh, a Piper Navajo, um, those are all airplanes that were in the fleet. What was the the closest? Like, how far is it away from? Is it closer to Anchorage or so, Juneau? Or? So it's about a, a. It was about a forty five minute flight in a. I took a Mall uh, M seven back and forth from Talkie, you know, to Anchorage a couple times uh-huh. out of the year, and it was about a forty five minute flight in a Mall. Okay. In terms of drive, I'd have to remember exactly. I think but it's it was, to the north. Yeah, yeah, to the north. Okay. I think it's about a three and a half hour drive north. Gotcha. So it's the closest town to Denali. Okay. So Mount Denali is the closest town to there, and what K two specializes in, even that airport is taking climbers to base camp at Mount Denali. Ah, uh, I gotcha. So you just go drop the climbers off and go pick them up three weeks later. So did you do any of the flying at all, or fly so along with? So after I was done able to, you know, fuel up the airplanes, load the climbers' gear, if there was an open seat, I was riding right seat right all the there. time. Yep. So how was a kid from the Midwest who's never seen a, <laughs> a mountain before now goes off to Alaska and you've got 
Mount Denali. Yep. Tallest peak in uh, North America, yeah. 20,320 feet. I mean, just overall, just... Uh, super eye-opening, as you know. Just yeah. the, It was like drinking out of a fire hose when you're seeing everything, and mm -hmm. you know, you're seeing a glacier for the first time, and you're seeing the way the glaciers curve, and the Ruth Glacier is 43 miles long. It's yeah. two to three miles wide on each side, and it moves two feet a day. It's, wow. it's hard to believe. And uh, you got that opportunity as a freshman. So I guess the lesson in that is, man... I think when you go to university or you go into a flight program, you just kind of put your head down and you just want to fly, fly, fly. But there's all these little opportunities that are available throughout, you know, your entire journey. Oh, yeah. You don't want to – it's good to have that focus to fly, but you have to take advantage of some of those opportunities because I'm sure you've learned a tremendous amount from that opportunity moving into the rest of your ratings and, mm -hmm. and that, being that, able to bring that along. That experience really opened my eyes to there's other – careers out here other than the airlines yeah so i was so interested in that that when i went back to the university to work on like we talked about finishing that instrument commercial and multi mm -hmm. hey w w what other opportunities are out here did you do uh any other internships i did yeah so uh, my freshman summer to that uh sophomore year i told you about alaska obviously that next summer uh i was able to be a um intern at the uh piper aircraft a headquarters international headquarters down, oh, in, down Vero, in florida vero beach florida oh yeah so how was that oh it was an amazing opportunity i uh what i did at the university was 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 post photos and and videos kind of about the, the flight training process on my own i was tagging piper tagging the university trying to show people what's out there what else is out there i was the first person for my high school to go to an aviation yeah. uh a flight school and a lot of my buddies from high school were asking, hey, I didn't even know that was an opportunity. I didn't know it you know, at the time either, but I'm trying to show the younger generations what else is out there. Yeah. So and you were doing this on? Uh, Instagram. Instagram. I was doing this on Instagram. Instagram. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the IG. <laughs> and uh, what that did was Piper noticed it. Piper yeah. reached out to me. They contacted the university, and the university had emailed me. I met with uh, somebody in marketing, and they said, hey, Piper reached out to us. They want to offer you a Zoom interview and want to get to know you a little bit better. Oh, wow. So I sat down with them, sat in a study room in Robin Hall, went through that interview sort of process, and they kind of got to know me a little bit. At the end of the interview, they offered me a internship position down there in Vero Beach that next summer. Wow. And before that summer, my plan was uh, to, to keep continuing posting what I did, and what they offered was a new program that they've never had before called the Piper Brand Ambassador Program. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I have heard of that. Yeah, so I was uh, myself and Carly uh, Shukar, we were the first two Piper Brand Ambassadors. It obviously started from the University of North Dakota. Yeah. And our intent was, and our purpose was to post Instagram stories, photos, one, at least one a week was our plan on the actual post, and to show what training was like in terms of the altitude chamber. Yeah. So I remember doing a post and saying what I what I'm learning today, you know, going up to two five oh or one eight oh or yeah. you know, seeing what it's like without oxygen for a little bit. Oh, that's cool. So that was the purpose and the real thing was to recruit high school students to show them what else is out there. Yeah. And why they should choose University of North Dakota. But also it was a bridgeway program between Piper Aircraft and the university mm -hmm. because we're obviously flying Piper products. Right. right. So that was cool. Well, it, it, just in that short time that you had at the University of North Dakota, I mean, you've gone two internships. Was mm -hmm. that that? Was that it? You did two. Yeah. Them, so like, yeah. So obviously the Alaska one I was talking about, freshman mm -hmm. summer. That next summer was in Florida, and what I was able to experience there was marketing, sales, and test flying. Is that what got you kind of more interested in the sales side? Exactly. Uh, so that's really what opened my eyes and allowed me to meet people at the different dealerships to have the job that I have now. And you probably would not have known that if you hadn't no, gone. No, no chance. Wow. Talking a little bit more about the internship, you were down there in Vero Beach. Mm -hmm. What what did you do down there? Yeah, so as, a, uh, intern, as an intern at Piper Aircraft in Vero Beach, I was able to experience sales, marketing, and test flying. Mm -hmm. So what that allowed me to do, let's just start off with sales, was to help the fleet sales manager. Uh, long story short of it is Piper at their um, factory down there at the international headquarters it just sells their trainers direct okay their m class series which is you know their turbo props and that m350 are through the dealer network mm -hmm. 
So I was just assisting in the fleet sales process and helping manage that a little bit in terms of being more so of a demo pilot is what I would say was my my role, uh, you know, bouncing back and forth between a few of the different colleges, delivering aircraft. So you were actually flying these airplanes yeah, to deliver? Yeah. So our biggest uh, customer at the time, or even as an intern, I wouldn't say I was flying a super a lot, a, a, a big amount when I was an intern, mm-hmm. but it was more so after that opportunity. But as an intern, we would fly every Thursday was to take two to four archers to ATP's headquarters in Jacksonville at Craig in oh, Florida. Okay. So that was kind of, that was, the, that was cool to look forward to every yeah. Thursday was to deliver brand new a- ATP archers <laughs> uh, to cool. Jacksonville. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of the, the sales role marketing wise. We'll talk about, um, kind of how I helped assist with the marketing team and picking photos out for the different brochures that were going to be hand, handed out at Oshkosh that are on their website, oh, cool. uh, different upgrades with the avionics or even interiors that Piper would be doing for the next year. Uh, so that was sales, marketing, and then obviously the test flying was really, really cool. Uh, I was able to see an airplane roll out of the factory, and that was that was special because a hangar door opens up, and they call that stage OTD, which means out the door. Mm-hmm. So you see a, uh, an ugly green <laughs> airplane roll out that door, and they call that the beer can. It uh-huh. looks like a airplane, obviously, you know, that aluminum color. It's that green that you can't forget right. after you see it, and it has no paint on it. So uh, Bart Jones, the chief pilot, he's been there since 89, I believe, or 88, has been test flying these airplanes since they've rolled them out. Yeah, Uh, I was fortunate to be able to go on a flight or two and experience that process and how an airplane gets certified, seeing the different quirks that need to be worked out of it. So that was really, really cool uh, to see an airplane get basically start from finish for four months. It takes an archer four months to be built Uh and then three hours to be test flown and signed off. Do they do that all three hours in one sitting, or is it so, a couple of different flights? It's about three different flights, okay. depending on, obviously, every airplane's different in terms of the quirks they need to work out of it. Um, yeah. Some some can certify as, as little as two flights, mm-hmm. or some of them might be five or six. It really depends on what, what they need to do. Gotcha. Okay. So after that internship, wrapped that up, obviously, headed back to UND, started my junior year. That's when COVID hit, mm-hmm. and was a little bit freaked out in regards to seeing all these f- old flight instructors that had left mm-hmm. UND that have gone to the oh, regionals. Go to the regionals, they were coming back. Even even uh, pilots that were at IOE or even they just started as FOs at a regional really? or were in training in ground school were being sent back to home yeah. or to their flight schools that they came from. Interesting. So UND was flooded with f- flight instructors as well as other universities across the country. And uh, that's where I kind of just decided to put my blinders on and really try and focus on finishing out my degree. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what COVID was at the time. Nobody knew how long it was going to last. So just kind of ride that process out. And if things took longer than usual, then it, so be it. Everybody else is going through it. Uh, Thankfully, you know, things kind of passed a little bit that junior year summers where I was like, you know what, COVID's here nobody's going to be having op- internship opportunities like I had. You know, I was jealous and, right. you know. Well, it's uh, a good thing that you got those opportunities early. Yeah. Right? And I would never know what's going to happen. I was, know? I was jealous to hear other people that got through before, you know, COVID happened, right. They, yeah. The people that made it right. But there, nobody was hiring as you know, for during COVID. So I was like focused, Hey, I'm going to stay here at the university. Thankfully, mm-hmm. thank God UND was still running. Obviously we had very tight, you know, protocols and, yeah. and, and, safety uh, regards, but was able to still work on flying there for the summer. So that was the only summer I actually stayed there was my junior year going into that senior year summer. And that helped me out tremendously in terms of being able to graduate down the road a semester early. So fast forward a little bit, you know, go to into senior year now, um, working on that CFI rating. So I was able to finish that up that fall semester, going into that spring semester, right at that Christmas time, I got uh, an email and, and talked to the boss at in Vero Beach about, um, you know, starting there full time. So, oh, going back as going, a full time employee. Now. Going back as a full time wow. employee down there in Vero Beach. So, what that entailed was to come on and, and they would train me to kind of be you know working that fleet sales role and try and sell airplanes to different universities across the country. So cool. that's where I kind of became more so of a demo pilot in a way. 
So that was your first job, essentially. Yeah, first okay. first real official job, I would say, out of, uh, out of college. Out of college. Gotcha. And what was that like? Oh, it was super fun because I. It was great because I did an internship. I knew what I was walking into, right? right? So I knew. And that's probably really helped you get the job. Yeah, yeah, and it, just in terms of shaking hands and meeting people and knowing who I can rely on and and who can who can be a mentor for me in regards to helping me out. And, and be able to grow as a person and get that knowledge, right? I'm coming yeah. in as somebody that didn't know anything in the sales role. That's, that's so it was really just trusting your mentor and uh, you know having grit into accepting that I don't know anything. I need yeah. I need to humility. Right? Yeah, <laughs> just having that humility that guess what I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I need to learn a lot. I still do that. <laughs> like I, hey, I'm still kind of new. So, <laughs> so uh, on that side, you know. That's when they offered that opportunity. Spring semester rolled around. This is where I was probably the most stressed out I've ever been mm -hmm. at, at, at the university level or just even in, in, in flight training. Yeah, talk, talk, talk about that because that happens a lot. Like, you know, I'm hearing it from a lot of, a lot of you know, guys and girls that are coming up and they're like, man, it is so stressful going through this process. Mm -hmm. Um, what did you do to kind of help mitigate that stress and, you know, maybe some lessons that you learned going through that would be valuable yeah. to those that are in the situation now or getting ready to go through it? I believe the, the the best thing I ever did through that college process was to get the group of friends I have now. Yeah. That group of, I know it sounds very generic and cliche, but that group of friends that I was with, we would we would sacrifice going out on a Friday or Saturday, Saturday night and going into Robin Hall and studying with four or five of us wow. and using those whiteboards and covering them with ink. Wow. That was, I think a lot of people that, you know, are completely solely studying by themselves will struggle with that interaction with, you know, when you're talking to somebody about something that you're learning, it's a lot easier to understand, right? right. If you're able to, if I'm able to, you know, write something here for you real quick, we're able to talk about that and have a discussion rather than just in my head. Right. So that was really what helped me the most in terms of handling that stress and that course load was to go, hey, I'm in class with two of my buddies. We're going to go after class and we're going to bang out, you know, two of these lessons mm -hmm. that we are going to do with our instructor next week. We're yeah. already going to do them now. Well, I mean, that takes discipline, right? That yeah. takes discipline and determination to actually do that because, <laughs> I mean, you're in college, Right, like you gotta have who fun wants, too. Who wants to like go study on a Friday or Saturday night? But you know, you got to put in the work to get through. Like, I think a lot of these check rides. So you got to have that balance, and yeah, it's right. it's great. You know, I went out a lot too. It, yeah. you know, I had that balance, but it was hey, when do I need to sacrifice a day to stay in and and, and really do this? Yeah. Uh, so that was a that was that was kind of the biggest thing is I think having that circle of friends that you can rely on, and especially somebody too that you know. Let's say you and I are best buddies, you know, at, you know, where we're 17, starting at UND all the way throughout the program. And, you know, you're at your commercial check ride. I'm two weeks behind you. I'm calling you up and I'm saying, hey, how was the check right. ride? Right. Yep. That was very, very, very valuable to yeah. me and to everybody else that had that group because you can say, hey, this is what I really need to focus on. This is what I didn't, you know, focus on when I was studying. And it's, hey, this is what, if, you know, if somebody busted a check ride, it's, hey, I learned from this, but I screwed this up. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell your buddy about it, and your buddy's not going to screw that up, right? right. So yeah. that that was a huge, huge, valuable uh, learning experience in my. I call opinion. that avoiding the potholes, right? <laughs> like <laughs> right. on your journey, yeah. You know? Like, hey, don't go over there. There's a pothole. Yeah. Um, cool, man. Okay, so getting through UND, you got your first job. We just talked about yep. being back at Piper. Um, they just give you an airplane. So my my. My vision of working for a manufacturer is like, hey, Ernie, here's the keys to an airplane. <laughs> like, go out and sell the airplane and just fly around. I wouldn't say places. it was like yeah. as super simple as that. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, there were times where, you know, Piper was getting, as you know, the demand we talked about earlier is so far out right now with these trainers. Yeah. When I started there, that full-time job in uh, 22, I believe it was. Yeah, because I graduated December 21. So starting 2022. Mm -hmm. The trainer market wasn't where it was today. It was getting there, but it wasn't where it is right now. So how far out were they? So okay. they were they were end of twenty two. So they were about a year out. About a year. About okay. a year. Now will, it's about two and a half, three years. I would say three. Three years. I would say about a three year. I'd say okay. you'd be lucky to get a reservation end of twenty five, but more specifically, probably middle of twenty six. Right. Wow. Right now. Okay. So I was tossed the keys, kind of like like you say, <laughs> and say, hey. 
my fleet sales manager said, hey, I've got four flight schools for you to go fly, uh-huh. fly to. And this could be leaving Vero Beach, and it could be as wild as, you know, I went to Oklahoma University mm-hmm. uh, all the way to, you know, here you guys are in Sierra Charlie here in Scottsdale, Arizona. I came out here with the airplane. Wow. So just all across the country. And the biggest thing was trying to focus and, and like you said before, kind of be disciplined in, in what you're doing on the road. Right. And what's, you know, what's the intent and what is my purpose of being on the road? What am I doing here? I'm obviously here to sell airplanes, demo the airplane, sit down with flight instructors, sit down with students and also the faculty and show them the airplane. So when you're when you're demoing, it's not just one or two flights at, right. at the school. It's taking up at least two students so they can see how the airplane feels. They can talk to their flight school about how they like it or if they don't like it. Yeah. And especially the faculty or because they're the ones that are going to be driving that public funding for those airplanes, right? Right. So really just showing them what the product has to offer. But in a other way, uh, you don't want to bounce between two different you know, flight schools all across the country. You want to get as many as close as you can together because right. then you're just wasting time. Sure. So that's where I would say the biggest part of discipline was. And, you know, if my boss sent me out on the road to do four, four or five flight schools, it was, hey, me on the side radioing and, and, and calling into different flight schools to say, hey, can I just demo the airplane to you? Even if you're not interested, maybe you might be in eight years yeah, because every eight to 10 years, a flight school seems to have that phase of that when they're turnover. turning over yeah. to a new fleet. So in doing that, you're doing all your flight planning, all your your own Yep. You know, dispatching basically yeah. and yep. fuel stops and all that stuff. Yeah, and, you, and, and it was really nice. Uh, Piper Piper never questioned me on where I was going in terms of where I was staying in the night or or why I stopped at, you know, a Charlie airspace or even a golf, you know, a small uncontrolled airport and, and you know, was getting fuel there. They never questioned me on that regard, so that was awesome. Mm-hmm. And especially, you know, as you know, some, some, some people get a little bit stressed out in terms of, hey, I have to go from point A to point B. I have to be here at a specific time. I right. have to, you know, even weather's a factor, as you know, is sure. being huge. So um, that was how I got a lot of my flight time. So that whole year, I worked there for about a year. Okay. I so del- you spent one year at Piper? I spent okay. a full year at Piper Aircraft okay. uh, after uh, UND, obviously. Mm-hmm. During that time when I was in the office and there wasn't a lot of deliveries to happen, I was also helping out with some of the deliveries to the different dealerships. I guess. So that's how I got my uh, job now. So I work, oh. I work at Muncie Aviation Company uh, located in Muncie, Indiana, uh, pretty close to Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. And uh, Labor Day of 22, I was told, hey, can you deliver a Archer, a Piper Archer LX to the dealership? They didn't have a pilot to take it there. So I said, yeah, I'll take it there. And Delivered the airplane, delivered the airplane to the uh, the I call him the big dog over there. That's yeah. my boss now, Martin Ingram. Uh-huh. Uh, he's the CEO at Muncie Aviation. He's been there 41 years and delivered the airplane to him right there. Wow! And he said, "Hey, you know, keep my contact. First time meeting him. Yeah. He's like, I've I've heard about you. I know you you deliver a lot of airplanes and you're learning the sales role. Mm-hmm. You're a young kid. I started this job. He told me he's like, I started here when I was 23 years old. Wow! And I was 23 at the time. Right. So he said, I need to call you in two weeks." Or two months, or I think it was two months. Uh-huh. So he called me two months later. So he said he was going to call you. He told me. Weeks. He said, "Save my number. I'm going to call you in two months." <laughs> and I, I had no idea what it was going to be about. I had, yeah. a, I had a suspicion that it was for a, a job opportunity. Sure. And at these dealerships, they really don't come out yeah. pretty often. Um, like, like I said, you know, Martin's been there 41 years. The other sales guy's been there over 30. Yeah. And the guy that I replaced now has been there for for se- he was there for 17 years. 17. So he called me and he said, hey, one of my sales guys retired at 49. Uh, kind of shocked me. And he's like, I need I need somebody to come out. But he's like, I want somebody young with young blood. So with me being from Illinois, I flew up there, took some PTO, you know, toured the area, mm-hmm. really liked the sales operations and what Muncie Aviation had in regards to how they operate a business. Yeah. And especially learning from Martin, he's like my best friend in terms of somebody I can go out with and have a good time with, or no matter what it is, Oshkosh, or yeah. even if we're in a, a very professional, strict business meeting. Right. So that was really cool to have a boss that you could call your best friend. Sure. Um, so yeah, working there, started there this January. So I've been there about a year as well. Yeah. And uh, we're a Piper and a uh, TBM dealership from Dyer. Oh, um, nice, nice airplane. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so man, like, you know, excellent lesson for everybody. You never know what opportunities are going to show up. I mean, 
you're here, you are, you're just delivering an airplane and the CEO says, Hey, keep my number. I'll call you, yep. you know, kind of thing. Yep. So, I mean, that's the thing about aviation, you know, it's such a small community. Um, you just never know where the next opportunity is going right. to come from. So always treat everybody with respect, you know, all the standard stuff, because you never know where that's going to lead. And, to, you know, talk a little bit more about that, too. Um, going through the collegiate program, I heard that all the time. Oh, and yeah. I was like, you know, really, how small is this industry? You know, it's all across the world. Oh, man. But everybody in the United States at least knows somebody that oh, knows yeah. somebody. Yeah. So I didn't really realize that until I got out of UND. Yeah. Once I got out of that bubble at UND, I was like, wow. Yeah. I know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. It was, yeah, that's true. And yeah. it's, it's don't take that lightly, I think, is the biggest thing. You no. Know, so you always want to have the best reputation because, you know, it's either a good thing or <laughs> it's not a good thing. Of course. You want it to be the other side. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. All right. So now you're at Muncie. You're selling. So are you selling both TBMs and Pipers Correct. over yep. there? Yep. Okay. So Piper-wise, we're selling like a talked about earlier how piper does does the trainers direct sure um so we have the opportunity as a dealer there's seven dealerships in the country mm -hmm. ours is kind of the great lakes region and we deal with the m class series so that's the m350 which is their you know 350 horsepower uh you know piston engine on that pa46 airframe then their next step is that uh they call it the old style is the meridian which is the m500 now and then obviously the m600 sls which is their flagship turbo and the pro. difference between the two is just the horsepower in the engine is that L right or yeah, a little bit more than that um the wings completely oh, the wings different wings wings completely different tails a little bit different fuselage identically the same uh avionics wise completely different the 600 is g3000 the m500 is g1000 oh, gotcha. uh, okay. the 600 also has the halo package um, if you're familiar with that, yeah. it's that auto land and, you know, the ESP built in, it's got auto throttle now as well. So it's, wow. it's a beast of an airplane. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's published for 274. I'll be honest with you. It does a little bit better than 274. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of a, a good, good thing to talk about. And it's cool to talk about is Piper, when they certify that M600, they didn't actually fly that to get that 274 number. They had an engineering team sit down mathematically figure out, hey, we think it's going to be a 274. You'll get a little bit more than 274, but you'll get 274 all day for true right. or not. Mm -hmm. So the spec sheet is is as advertised. It is. Unlike <laughs> and, a lot of other spec sheets yeah. that we see that are not. <laughs> yes, okay. and that is, you know, it's 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 funny when you tell somebody that because they're yeah. all like, ah, you're, you're full of it, you know, you're, yeah. you're, you're lying about it. But no, that is an airplane that is solely – designated on that spec sheet no for what, it, what the performance numbers are. Uh, how do you like uh, the TBM? A TBM is a killer of an airplane. Yeah. Um, it's it's night and day in terms of anything I've ever flown, especially my whole life pretty much flying the, that Piper fleet. Mm -hmm. It's um, just one more step above that M600. If you're an M600 you know buyer mm -hmm. and you're flying that airplane for a couple of years, your next step is a TBM. It's a TBM. Right. Uh, so just describe what is... Uh, you know, like the horsepower's a little yeah. more. I know it's faster, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you go up to 850 horsepower on certain models, which is the 850, and then you can go all the way up to 895. Oh, wow. So, you know, we could sit here all day and kind of talk about, you know, the different versions and what the TBM offered, but the long story short of it is 88, 1988, Dyer started making the TBM. Mm -hmm. they, they designated it solely for their French Army. Oh, and wow. in 1991 is when they actually certified the airplane for the public use. So okay. 91 is when the 700, they call it the A models, rolled out. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, you know, it's their their beginner TBM. It's all the same airframe. The 960 now mm -hmm. is the same airframe as the 700, really, except for a few a few quirks. Okay. But that was their introduction to the TBM. It was a 700A model, then it goes a 700B, and then it goes into a C2. So that's kind of a 700 branch. Then you go up to an 850 mode. Mm -hmm. So what the 850 mode entails which is really, really cool from a pilot standpoint. If you're a guy that loves flying an airplane and loves to actually do something in there and not have it all automated, the 850 is your airplane. Really? And why I say that is, like I was telling you, it's 850 horsepower on that engine, but on takeoff, they restrict you to 700 horsepower. Really? So so they derate it. They derate it down to that 700 range, and how you go into 850 is an 850 mode. Okay. So is I don't that want, like a crew setting or so right when you clean up the airplane is when you can go into that eight fifty mode. Mm -hmm. They believed at that time 
more than 700 horsepower on takeoff was too much. I got you. So how it works is where your flap setting is to the right of your, you know, your throttle quadrant. There's a detent, so let's just start at the very top of your flaps. So we'll, that will be where your 850 mode is. Then you have your flaps in zero. Mm-hmm. Below that, you'll have takeoff and then flaps landing. So when you're taking off, obviously you're taking your flaps into, into flaps takeoff. Mm-hmm. So when you clean that airplane up and you're taking off and you're climbing through your, your cruise setting, you obviously retract those flaps to go to the neutral for zero. Mm-hmm. And then you'll go lift that flap handle up out of a gate and then go forward into an 850 mode. So then you add 150 horsepower for the climb out. For the climb out. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So that's really cool in that regard. Is you know it, it feels like you're actually flying and doing something, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Instead of everything being automated. So then uh, the 850, you know, was kind of that mid to 2010 range. You know, they came out in 2008, 2007, and they're all the way up to the early 2010 range. Mm-hmm. And then obviously they have the 900 series now. So the 900 series mm-hmm. really where they started implementing a lot of different features right now they build a 960 and that airplane's got the g3000 it's got the door for the pilot too right yep yep yeah so even the 850 does oh yeah the 850 is when they implemented that pilot door Uh, and the cargo door which is funny because most uh tbm owners are i'm assuming are owner operators they're owner flown yeah i'd say i'd say 90 percent of them are yeah yep so uh, that was I got to get me a ride in that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get a 960 yeah, or 960. 940. Hey, man, I'll take anything. Okay. And <laughs> the 940 and the 960 are um, really identical, but um, different in both ways in terms of especially the performance. Yeah. Um, the 960, a lot of people are liking it more so in terms of if you're solely automated. You're like, hey, I don't want to worry about anything of me damaging this airplane. So it, obviously it's got that FADEC engine on there. Right. The 940... Uh, has an engine that has a, a TBO time of 2,700 hours. The 960 is up to 5,000 hours wow. because of that FADEC system. Just because of the FADEC? Just because of the FADEC. And, you know, they tweaked a couple things too. Sure. Um, but but 5,000 hours, that's something you wouldn't even wow. see in your lifetime <laughs> so, owning that airplane. Uh, so let's say I'm a brand new TBM owner. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is the warranty like? Yeah, so that? so you get a five-year warranty. So let's just kind of talk about if you were to buy a, a TBM right now in 960, sure. what, what do you get with that? So right. you get, we'll start off with the schooling. Mm-hmm. So you get two slots for schooling. Let's just say if you're the only pilot, okay, let's say you're the only pilot on this airplane, you'll get two slots. You'll go to your- Sam will be upset at me. If I- <laughs> <laughs> you'll, go to your, you'll go to your initial training uh-huh. at SimCom. You'll go through that. It's about an eight-day course. You'll get that done, be a breeze. Um, you'll have no problem with it. It's really just kind of getting to know the airplane, especially from you stepping up from your Cirrus. You're already familiar with the avionics. Sure. Easy course. Then, like I said, if you're the only person doing it, then that next year when you go to recurrent training, you can use that second spot. Uh, Let's you. just say it's you and your buddy. Mm-hmm. You had those two spots. Then you can both just go to initial, and then you're done. So then you have to pay for your recurrent that next year. What is a, what is a recurrent running? Yeah, roughly? so it, it can be anywhere from 9 to 12 grand roughly really? on, on okay. a 960. Um, the different models are a little bit less, but the 960 is probably the most. And the reason for that is the 960, let's just say you went through the 960 course. Mm-hmm. Surprisingly, that in, for the insurance will override you on any of the other TBM models. Really? 700 all the way up to 960, okay. which is good to know. Yeah. But if you do it the opposite way, like you get it on a 700, it doesn't, doesn't count you for a 960. So you still have to go back. and Right. Okay. Wow. Okay. So... That's the schooling that's involved with the purchase of the airplane. And then let's talk about a UCP program. That's a five-year plan. So what that what that means is it's an ultimate care plus plan. Okay. So so kind of like uh like on, you know, like a light jet, you have like the tap blue for yep. the engines. Yep. You're basically paying per hour to have them covered. In a in a way, yes. Uh, but when you're buying the TBM, you don't pay you're not on an engine maintenance program in terms of, hey, I'm flying at 150 hours a year. I'm being charged this per year. Mm-hmm. No matter if you fly it, whatever it is per year, mm-hmm. you don't have to worry about it. So it's a five-year plan or 1,000 hours in that five years. Okay. And what that entails is you bring that airplane in for an annual mm-hmm. or an oil change or anything, it's all covered. Oh, that's awesome. The dealer takes cover. It, you know, takes, takes care of it. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about that as an owner and operator. The only thing that you're ever paying for, I, th- I believe they, they just changed – um, don't quote me on this, but is the consumables. Yeah. 
it tires sense. and brakes. Those yeah. are the only two that you're really responsible for as an owner. Okay. So that's really nice, you know, for somebody to come in. They're going to buy the airplane for five years after that five year, you, you know, plan, which is about what the warranty is. We'll talk about that as a five year warranty across the board, as well as a seven year on the engine and whatnot. Yeah. So there's different plans where you can kind of go ahead and purchase those if you want to upgrade and, you know, extend the life of your warranty, but it's really not necessary, especially yeah. with five years. I was going to say five years. Now you're nailed down on your operating costs for right. five years. You really don't have to. You know, I mean, maintenance being the big worry of all that. Um, okay. Let's just say, now what are the steps? If I was a brand new, like, say, TBM owner, and I'm, I'm coming to you, what are some of the things that I'm probably not thinking about mm -hmm. that I probably should be considering a purchase of? Right. And I obviously think. that's, you know, different for every every person, every different scenario. Um, like, Let's just say that you're somebody that's coming at 500 hours, okay? You own a Cirrus, which is typically what we see is somebody that owns a Cirrus that has 500 to 1,000 hours, and they're you know interested in buying a TBM. There are a couple questions that they have right off the bat is, can I get insured? That's a big one. And that is the number one part of the sales process is, can our customer get insured, okay. right? Because that, that'll bust your deal right yeah. there, is, is, um, is my customer insurance worthy? What are you seeing in that? In that sector, so, right so our, in terms of the price on, in on terms an airplane, of price and just insurability, like what is uh, you know my partner in the Cirrus, he's a low time pilot, right? What, what what is the hour requirement you think going to where you'll really see a, a real big decrease in the price is is that thousand hour requirement, thousand hours, just like the thousand airlines. hours with a private and instrument. Rate. They want to see the instrument. Actually, surprisingly, too, even if you have no purpose of using that airplane for a commercial operation if you do have your commercial ticket that'll help you out oh significantly i um, not sure why they they do see that as something that they can um you know it's just an extra rating in in my eyes that they yeah. can throw on there for you and obviously if you're coming in with different endorsements they can see hey they can handle different endorsements to the point where like the training was going to be no problem for you because uh, okay. very rarely you will have some people that will not be able to finish that initial training down at simcom and might have to redo it or, or just fail it in general so that can that can mess you up too, um, but it's really just, you know, is this the airplane for me? Is this what I want? Does this fit my mission? What is that? What is the typical mission of a TBM? Yeah, like? so great question. The, the we'll just talk right off the bat on the range on it. So if it was just me and you in that airplane, and we had full fuel, and we needed to use it for something for business, and we had super long legs of different satellite offices or businesses that we had. They publish 1730 nautical miles on that 960 wow. or 940, I should yeah. say. But you're probably going to get about 1500, um, yeah. right, based on the winds and whatnot. So really, if you need an airplane with legs and speed, that is your airplane. Yeah. If you're talking about just moving, you know, three to 500 nautical miles, probably not your airplane as long as you're okay with paying for that operating cost, right? Mm -hmm. So where we see that big transition of how we do it at Muncie is we see somebody come in from a Cirrus, if you're, if it, let's just say you get, you got 250 hours, typically what we'll see the bridge is to Cirrus, to an M350, to an M600, to a TBM, and the wow. reason for that, and there's so many stepping stones, is for the insurance. If you're okay right off the bat paying a lot of insurance that first year, that principal being super super high, mm -hmm. then so be it. Go to the TBM. What if what if I said, you know what, I'm a 250 hour pilot, um, I just want to go straight to the M600. Okay. Like skip yep. the 350. Yep. What What are you seeing? In, do you know what the rates would yeah. be, or have a guess? So we had we had a customer this week that actually just closed on a, a December M600 position, a mm -hmm. 2023 one that's being built right now. He's got 250 hours total time. He owns a 2012 Cirrus, mm -hmm. and with an instrument, with an instrument rating, okay. and started calling around four different insurance companies to see, you know what that might be. And as you know, it's a very, very, very broad range. They can't tell you exactly until they plug you into the system. Sure. But from them being able to pull up other applicants and figuring out, hey, somebody that can f fit your customer that you're talking about, you're looking anywhere from like 60 to even up to over that six-figure number on an M600. Really, for insurance per year. All right. Well, uh, we are coming up on that hour mark, so we'll start wrapping it up. But give me uh, – give me – some of your best advice to someone that's just starting out mm -hmm. right now, uh, getting ready to look for a place to get their flight training done, what advice would you give them? Really take your time in terms of where you're located, right? Look around and see where 
your region has to offer in terms of a flight school and how what what your goal is. Do you want to bang it out very quick? Are you not worried about that time frame in terms of I don't care how long it takes for me to get what what is your goal, right? Mm -hmm. So once you do that, actually go walk on the campus if it's a university or like a you know a part sixty one mom and pop school. Go check it out. Go meet people. See how you feel working with them. Yeah, how do you like the their culture too? Yeah, right? of course. Yeah. And when you can, if you can, talk to a student that's there on the side and say, "Hey, how how's your transition? How how's your process of flight training?" Mm -hmm. And that'll really tell you right there because you're getting it straight truth, right? Mm -hmm. You're not getting some of that sugarcoating anything that you might read on a review or something. Right. So I really think just going there with the principle of, "Hey." I got nothing to lose. I'm going here to walk on the campus and the property and to really meet the people and see how Talking. I feel. Yeah. How no, comfortable like are you? Uh, advice on internships? Yeah, internships really, you know, check your email like right. I, like I did <laughs> or really just go on Indeed and that's actually with that internship I saw in the email, it was actually posted on Indeed. So really yeah. just look look things up. And I would say the other thing, too, in the past couple of years is social media has really grown, That's as true. you know, yeah. in terms of actually posting those. So really look on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter mm -hmm. and, and, and check those internships out. Cool. And if I'm in the, in the market for a TBM, <laughs> what advice? Uh, you know, really know what you're getting yourself into in terms of how many hours are left on that engine if it's a used airplane, um, how many owners and operators had it, you know, where did that airplane get taken care of? Another thing, too, I really recommend is if you're looking at a used airplane, like especially a turboprop, mm -hmm. make sure they're taking it to not more than, you know, maybe two maintenance shops. When you start seeing somebody bring in an airplane to different maintenance shops, it starts raising red flags in my eyes about, sure. you know, why is that? That's you a good point. Know, you know, so I really like, you know, if I was buying a, an airplane, it's really where was the maintenance done and do I trust them? Uh, is, are they? Uh, do they have a good reputation is what I should say. All right. Well, that's it uh, for this podcast. I want to thank Mike for coming on and kind of giving his experience and maybe giving you guys a little bit of motivation on, you know, don't just take the, the traditional career path. Try to learn something as you're going along and find something new. You may find something that you want to do that maybe wasn't on the plan. So, right. Mike, thanks for your time, man. Thank you, Ernie. It's uh, good having you on here and and let's go get some get some lunch. All right, it sounds good. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks Thank again you. for listening. We'll see you on the next podcast. Going up, going up, going up, going up, going up.